Welcome, friends. Good morning. It's actually early morning here for me. Um, looking forward to having the part two conversation of Context is King. That's what we're going to be dialoguing about today. Uh, again, please please do follow on YouTube as well as we have a new feature I want to show you on the website if you desire to be notified of when the next post comes out. Would love for you to smash the notification button. <laughs> All right, let me show you how to do this. So if you head over to the Thinking Cup podcast and in the upper right-hand corner, you go to study resources. Obviously, there's a lot of things that you can look at, but if you go to blog articles, and then on this page, as you engage, there will be a notification button that pops up down here. The first time that you enter, and all you'll need to do is hit that notification button. When you do that, it will also ask at the top if you want to receive communication from this website. So if you do want to do that, just uh, head over and uh, you can take care of that on the website. Now, let's dive in to today's discussion. Um, we are continuing part two of a conversation, Context is King, and the whole premise behind this dialogue is about the context that people read doctrines into uh, the scripture. And so what I'd like to do as we dialogue a little bit on this is I'd like to first point out the premise or the main dialogue, the main statement that I am discussing. Now, if you haven't caught part one of this, I would really encourage you to go to the website and catch part one. But this is the statement that we're uh, discussing. So Avenus as well as other Christians, but Adventists and other Christians knowingly and unknowingly ignore Scripture's context. And when I'm talking about context, there's lots of different contexts. I've just put a few on the screen, but you've got covenantal. We're going to talk a lot about that. Covenantal context, historical context, cultural, theological, political, social, audience, and media context. And in my opinion, the most important context, which is the context that created the verse that's being quoted or discussed. And of course, this is important because when we hopscotch around and dialogue about, you know, jump around to different verses, um, inevitably we're oftentimes taking the text itself out of its context. Um, so, <clears throat> I have been... Uh, if you spent any time inside of Adventism, and I just have to know, I have to state this up front, okay? Many have asked, well, Mike, why do you talk so much about Adventism? I need everyone here to understand that my context inside of my upbringing, I'm a 40 plus recovering, 40 plus year recovering Adventist. And I say recovering uh, because I'm learning a lot. <laughs> Um, and so if you spend any time with me and you dialogue, you, you're going to see me engage with the hermeneutical principles and the assumptions that Adventists come to Scripture with. Um, now, I think that that gets misused and abused. I think that all Christians do this to, to some extent. I think that I need to guard against this as well. I am not um, safe from this same accusation. 
But if you spend, again, any time with me dialoguing, the reason why that I engage so much in the Adventist framework is because that is the context through which I've learned most of Scripture, okay? Um, and so in the, uh, in, in the Adventist church community, you're bound to hear uh, something about the importance of eating right. Um, again, we're talking about context, okay? We're talking about the framework of context, and this is part two. So if you haven't caught part one, you need to go back. This is an extension of the first conversation. And uh, what I want to do, let me share my screen real quick with you. <clears throat> All right, so what I want to do is I, I want to first dig in to, and, and what we're looking at is the software program that I use for study. Uh, we're going to go to, this is in the ESV version, we're going to go to 1 Corinthians 3.17. So if you spent any time inside of the Adventist realm or you've engaged with an Adventist at any level, you're going to hear inevitably the importance of eating biblically. Uh, 1 Corinthians 3.17 is an extremely popular proof text that's used in the Adventist framework when, uh, when, they, when they want to promote or defend or argue for some sort of continued obligation of the Levitical dietary distinctions and restrictions for Christians. And this is, this is what the text says. I'm going to make this just a tad bit bigger. <clears throat> And then, again, this is proof texting, ripping it out of context, okay? But here's the text, verse 17. If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him, for God's temple is holy, and you are that temple. Now, the whole point of this and the premise for an Adventist is, hey, you're the temple, you need to put uh, good things in your body or else you're going to desecrate it. God's going to destroy you. Uh, that's a pretty strong argument. Now, when you view this particular, this, this, this dialogue, okay, when viewed out of Paul's dialogue context with the Church of Corinthians uh, or Corinth, this, this vegan or vegetarian Adventist Ellen G. White health advocating framework is going to inevitably prove the verse to mean that God is going to destroy Christians for eating pork and other unclean meats that the law forbade. That, that's the conclusion if it's taken out of context, okay? And they're usually going to connect this. I'll show you how this works. They're going to connect this with Isaiah 66... 17 to bolster their position see i mean you just read that your temple like your body is a temple and god's going to destroy you if you desecrate it right and let's go back to isaiah 66 17 those who sanctify who sanctify and purify themselves to go into the gardens following one of them in the midst eating pig's flesh and the abomination and mice shall come to an end altogether declares the lord now, <clears throat> this is wildly out of context, okay? Uh, it's extremely out of context. But, again, if, if we keep our interpretation inside the context of 1 Corinthians 3.17, Paul states in that context, Paul states that God will destroy some people for dividing the church with strife with jealousies, with carnality, with factions, and attempting to build on false foundations instead of building on Jesus Christ. So, quoting an Old Testament verse from Isaiah and ripping it out of its context to bolster a misinterpreted opinion from 1 Corinthians 3.17, all while not realizing that the Adventist stance is usually coming from a Gentile Christian position and not from a Jew position, 
Okay, who, by the way, Jew, when I say that, they had a reason to care about the Levitical dietary laws. But taking this in this context is, it's just, unfortunately, it's just blatant misuse of Scripture, and it's twisting it to manipulate the behaviors of people, of church members. You need to eat this way. Okay, and I, I don't mean that to be rude or dogmatic, but this is what happens inside of a framework that's gets, that gets taken out of context. Now, we have, um, we've, we've talked about this uh, before, and um, so I'm just going to go to it again. I'm going to share my screen again. <clears throat> um, We've been dialoguing on Facebook about uh, Sabbath, about the um, obligation to Sabbath. <clears throat> so this, this is an, a tendency with Adventism. Okay, Adventists will also do the same thing with this Sabbath context. Uh, they, they use Exodus 20, 8 to 11, to mandate salvational Sabbath keeping for Christians. Now, some won't go as far as saying salvational. I get that. I understand that, okay? But the church at large has a fundamental belief that requires an individual to keep the Sabbath, okay? But the problem is, is that by going to Exodus 20, 8 through 11, it's ignoring the Sabbath's covenantal context, and I'm going to talk through a lot. I know many of you have been hearing me talk about this, but we, we can't ignore, okay? What happens is they attempt, if you argue salvational Sabbath keeping, it's required, it's obligated, it's, it's obligatory to us, okay? Then the only way you can do that is they attempt to separate all the other 603 laws from the Ten Commandments. Now, when I say 603 laws, friends, all I need you to do is read Exodus 20, okay? This is the Ten Commandments, okay? You shall not steal, right here. The Ten Commandments end right in, uh, in, in this, right in here, okay? There's some flashing and lightning, in, in, and said to Moses, you speak to us, and we will listen, but do not let God speak to us, let, lest we die, and then what happens? And the Lord said to Moses, Thus you shall say, you, sh you have seen, and they go on. You shall not make gods. These are continuations to the same laws that were given. There is no separation. There's no like, hey, these are the only laws. So what happens is if you read through all these other laws, the ten get ripped out of context and the other 603 get forgotten about. <clears throat> and so what happens when they pull them out of that context, okay, they take the other 603 and they mark them under ceremonial or civil laws. And by doing that, when, when the New Testament talks about the law being nailed or being done away with, okay, to the cross, then, oh, don't worry about the 10 it's the other 603 that are done away with, okay? But, and this is what happens, but the Ten Commandments are eternal and forever, and they're always binding on humanity. Now, if you want to understand all the ins and outs, okay, of, of that argument, I really encourage you to go back to thethinkingcup.com and click on the series in the blog articles where I begin to talk about uh, the law, okay? All right, so so that's that's kind of the premise behind um, how things can get misused. Now, all these wild scriptural gymnastics are to miss the point as it relates to the Sabbath. It misses the point entirely. Okay, the Sabbath was given to Israel as their specific covenant sign between God and themselves to demonstrate that we have, uh, that they have been saved 
through the Egyptian slavery. They've been uh, redeemed out of that. They've been set apart as a, as a particular or a peculiar people, and that, that He is their God. Now, you might say, Mike, where are you getting this from? Again, don't take my word for this, okay? We're going to bring this back up on the screen. And, and I want to encourage you, don't take anyone's word for it, okay? Um, if you head over to Exodus 31.13, it's very, very clear, okay? Um, you are to speak to the people of Israel. This is the Lord speaking to Moses and say, above all, you shall keep my Sabbaths. He's speaking to Moses, okay, in context, for this is a sign. This is a sign between me and you throughout your generations. Now, I get it. Some will argue well, we're still a part of the generations. It just keeps going on. Uh, be careful, okay? It's a sign forever between me and the people of Israel that in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. Now, this isn't the only place that we can go to, okay? Deuteronomy 5.15, this is, the, this is the, the third iteration of the Ten Commandments. Okay, we have the first one on Mount Sinai, it was broken, and then we have another one given after he broke the, the tablets. Okay, this is, this is after the third iteration. You shall remember that you were slaves in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out from, from there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath, commanded you. Okay? It, it was a specific group of people. Um, if we move over to Ezekiel 20, verse 12, okay? Moreover, I gave them my Sabbaths. It's pluralized, friends. It's not just one Sabbath, okay? Um, as a sign between who? Me and them, that they might know that I am the Lord who sanctifies them. You can go down to verse 20, and keep my Sabbaths, and I am the Lord your God. Walk in my statutes. Be careful to obey my rules. He, spe he was speaking with regards to the Israelites. And keep my Sabbaths holy, that they might may be a sign between me and you, that you may know that I am the Lord your God. So we, we have to understand, guys, that covenants in the Old Testament were specific relationship arrangements. That, that's, what, that's what these are. The relationship arrangements between two parties with very specific things to bring to the oath pledge. Very, very specific things. Each side, now we talked about previously bilateral, we talked about unilateral, we're in a bilateral covenant relationship. God required something of the group that he was in covenant relationship with, and the people were required to do something back. God was going to do something for them. Now, I want to move over to, I want to talk about this covenant relationship real quick. And in order to do this, we're going to go to a, um, just a tiny excerpt. We don't have time to go through all the details, but I want to show you the actual receipts on this, okay? Um, this is out of the Lexham Bible Dictionary, speaking on the word, the Hebrew word for covenant, Baruth. Okay, um, and it's it says this <clears throat> in this particular um, this particular uh, article. I don't remember who it's written by. I can find that out. Um, it's all the footnotes are in the article um, on the website if you if you want to read through it. Uh, a sacred kinship bond between two parties ratified by swearing an oath. Covenant making was a widespread custom throughout ancient Near East and Greco-Roman culture, serving as a means to forge socio-political bonds between individuals or groups. God's covenants are prominent in every period of salvational history. Divine covenants reveal the saving plan of God for establishing communion with Israel and the nations ultimately fulfilled by the death and resurrection of Christ. Now, the, the first question that I would ask myself, 
the very first question that I would ask myself, what covenant arrangement are we under currently as Gentile Christians? And I'm speaking if you're a Gentile, if you're a Jewish Christian, then same thing. But are we under the Mosaic covenant? Are we required to become Jews as Gentile Christians and therefore follow the Jewish requirements? These are questions I would ask. The answer for me, absolutely not. Okay? In fact, this is precisely what was, what was discussed in the Jerusalem Council around A.D. 50. Um, it was about 20 years after Jesus' resurrection, and we, we're going to find these details in Acts 15. And let's just go ahead and go over uh, to Acts 15 so that you can see this here. But you're going to find this <clears throat> um, in Acts 15. Now, I want you to read through Acts 15, 1 to 29, okay, all the way through. Notice this is the council, the council letter to Gentile believers. And what you're going to find here is it was during this meeting of the minds that Peter, Paul, Barnabas, James, and other elders, with the blessing of the Holy Spirit, they're the ones that determined exactly what, under the new covenant, Gentile believers were not required to do and were, were asked to do, okay? To, to, that they were not required to become circumcised or keep the law of Moses. Just read through the section. They were, they were not commanded to keep the Sabbath laws, the feasts, the Levitical dietary laws, the purity laws, any other civil laws, ceremonial laws, okay? There are, believe it or not, there are four restrictions that are given. And the premise behind these restrictions... <laughs> my, my dog just came in. Um, the, the premise behind these particular prescriptions was to create unity in the body of Christ. Unity between the two major factions, Jewish brothers and sisters in Christ and Gentile Christians. Okay, These are the four things that were asked. Abstain from things that have been sacrificed to idols. Abstain from blood. Abstain from anything that has been strangled. And abstain from sexual immorality. Now, they claimed that only these things, only these things needed to be followed from Jewish customs to refrain, uh, to remain united in Christ. These things were not required for salvation, but would help unify. That's the key here. They would help unify Gentiles and Jewish Jesus followers and prevent unnecessary friction. Now notice, I want you to notice when you read through this, that the Sabbath, circumcision, the Ten Commandments, they're not mentioned. None of these things are mentioned. And, and please don't argue from a position of silence. Well, it didn't say anything. It was understood. No, you, you, can't, you, can't, you can do that, but that's, that's a, a weak argument. Okay? They're, they're not required to worship on a specific day, again, for salvation. However, Adventists, in my framework, okay, growing up, Adventists have, have missed the mark in this idea. And the problem is, is that they allow Ellen White to read into the correct interpretation of the Word of God. And unfortunately, Ellen White's interpretations have confused the Bible and have caused much unnecessary harm to the body of Christ. Christians are, are we're not under the old Mosaic covenant. That's just a fact. Therefore, they are not obligated to keep the Old Covenant sign, the Sabbath, or, or any other Old Testament law. They're not obligated, okay? One might want to honor a particular Old Testament custom. There's nothing wrong with that. Paul even talks about that. Some esteem certain days. That's fine. Do what your conscience dictates, okay? But there's no obligation to the Old Testament laws to come before God, or to engage with God, or to be saved in that way. Okay, now, the Seventh-day Adventist Church, again, my context, okay, 
is fixated. I'm going to go into one last thing as we as we finish this dialogue. Um, one other aspect that comes into view with this fixation of the Sabbath also gets uh, tied to the mark of the beast. And uh, it, it, I don't know why it's a fixation. It's it comes from their early, early, early pioneer years. Okay, um, and so they they feel compelled to share with others the, the truth. That's that's what it's called, right? So that others won't unintentionally. Here's the thing: be, we need to share this with you so, you so you don't unintentionally get the mark. Okay, we want you to know the truth. Okay, and the proof text that that happened for this is Revelation 13, 11 through 18. Now, you can read through this section, right? Okay, it talks about the two horns like, like a lamb, it spoke like a dragon. Okay, and, but I want you to catch the, the words here. There's lots of, of words that talk about worship. Okay, it performs great signs. It's allowed to breathe and give, you know, all this stuff. But here at the end, okay, here's kind of where it is. Also, it causes all, both small and great, both rich and poor, both free and slave, to be marked on the right hand or on the forehead so that no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark. That is the name of the beast or the number. This calls for wisdom. And then they talk about the 666 number, okay? Now, this is this is the... Um, the challenge here. So Adventists believe that Christians, catch what happens here, that Christians will sometime in the future receive the mark of the beast for worshiping God on Sunday. This is where the misapplication comes. The day itself is the primary function of the mark of the beast. And the reason that this gets propagated is thanks to Ellen White. She wrote about this in the Review and Herald all the way back in 1897. This was July 13. This is what she said. If the light of, the, of truth has been presented to you, if, if you've heard, if you're watching this and you've heard me talk about the Sabbath, you've had that presented to you, okay? Revealing the Sabbath of the fourth commandment and showing that there is no foundation in the, bio, in the word of God for Sunday observance, that's a fallacy. And yet you still cling to the false Sabbath, refusing to keep holy the Sabbath, which God calls my holy day. Here's where it comes from. You receive the mark of the beast. I'm going to make this a tad bit bigger. What do, when does this take place? When you obey the decree that comes, commands you to cease from labor on Sunday and worship God. While you know that there is not a word in the Bible showing Sunday to be other than a common working day, you consent to receive the mark of the beast and refuse the seal of God. There's, there's the back and forth, the mark of the beast, seal of God. If we receive this mark in our foreheads or on our, uh, in our hands, the judgments pronounced against the disobedient, mu disobedient must fall upon us. But the seal of the living God is placed upon those who consciously keep the Sabbath of the Lord. Now, I just want you to understand, this is where this comes from, okay? It's essential to understand. When, when, you're, when, when you're having this dialogue about the mark of the beast, we have to keep the context of Revelation in, in mind. Revelation was a letter, and it was written by John, was sent out to seven literal churches— that are described in Revelation 1. And I know this might be trivial, okay? It might seem small. But keeping things in context, we not remembering that this letter was sent to the churches, seven churches, literal churches, can easily cause the modern reader to forget that the context of Revelation should be understandable to the seven churches to which it was written. John wouldn't be writing about things only a modern reader could understand. John wasn't writing to Jews. Uh, John was, actually he was, my, my bad. John was writing to Jews and Gentiles. After all, this was the, the, it was a post-Jesus Christian world where both Jews and Gentiles 
were welcomed into the body of Christ. Gentiles weren't being forced to keep Jewish sacred days to have the seal of God. Or if they they didn't keep them, they weren't getting the mark of the beast. Worship was always at the center of the mark of the beast. But Adventists have applied their own Ellen White view in the text by asserting that a physical day, okay, Sunday worship, not just worship, not just honoring God, not, not who, where is your loyalty? Instead, it's now a physical day. It's Sunday. Sunday is now the, what causes the work of the beast, the, the mark of the beast to be applied. Now, I want to move over to a, um, an article, and I just want to read in context. This is taken from uh, Neither Poverty Nor Riches, a Biblical Theological uh, Theology of Material Possessions. This is by Craig Blomberg, and he makes this statement. The enigmatic mark of the beast also contains economic implications. The Antichrist will force anyone who wishes to buy and sell to receive some kind of mark on their right hands or on their foreheads. This imagery probably reflects the ubiquity of the imperial cults at the end of the first century, not, at, not least in Asia. Although no exact parallel to this practice has emerged, the mark could well have referred to an idolatrous imperial image on a coin or have corresponded in function to stamps on deeds of sale from the first century world. Many, and what I want you to understand is many scholars who are not blinded by a specific framework through Ellen White's understanding is they're, or they're not forced to make Scripture say exactly what she says, have noted several important contextual relevant points, okay? I want to go to a a journal article. This is out of the Tyndale Bulletin on uh, in May of 1991 on the mark of the beast. This term, okay, this particular term, which if you don't know Greek, this particular term, okay, is um it's just it's just the term for mark. Okay, that's all it is. Okay, the mark of the beast. This term in Revelation 13, 16 ordinarily implies an engraved mark or a seal impression or inscription. The Roman government under Augustus had already been issuing tiles as proof of entitlement to the periodic grain dole. Presumably, you got one when marked off on the roll, and then gave your tile in at the granary. We don't, we don't have time. This isn't necessarily, I'm not designing this talk today to go through all of the Mark of the Beast. I'll probably do that at another time, okay? But this, that, and that's not really the purpose of this conversation. It's all about taking things out of context, okay? Many scholars have written excellent books, articles, monographs, contextual possibilities of understanding Revelation. And please, 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 you don't have to be a scholar to understand this stuff, but we can absolutely utilize scholastic academic work to help us. These guys are specialists in their areas of work, okay? I want to read one more article here. And this is, um, that's a tad bit too big. Um, This is from a a work called uh, The Greco-Roman World of the New Testament Era, Exploring the Background of of Early Christianity by James Jeffers. And it says this, A number of New Testament commentaries have seen a connection between Rome and its cult of emperor worship and the book of Revelation. The reference in Revelation 17, 9 to seven heads of the beast, which are seven hills on which the woman sits, has been taken as a reference to the famed seven hills on which Rome was founded. I I bring this up because we often forget that the letter of Revelation was would, would need to meet, make sense to the first century Christians. So the seven the the seven hills makes sense 
in the Roman context to refer to the seven hills that relate to the cultic worship. Okay, that's the, pri the, the primary point of the Mark of the Beast isn't about Sunday. The primary point of the Mark of the Beast is refusal, f refusal of worship. Who do you worship? Okay, not what day. It doesn't say that in the in the text. And if Christians refuse to worship the imperial cult through the emperor and his image, they would face economic boycott. Now, what we what we have to understand, okay, and I'm going to, to read uh, one other quote, and this comes from, um, I've highlighted it in a Kindle document that I'm reading, and this is from the person of Jesus, God's obligatory Sabbath. Um, and the, the gentleman that wrote this is, um, is, a, is a, a gentleman by the name of Baldwin, is his last name. Um, and so I, I just want you to, um, give me one second, I just want you to pay attention to what this particular author is also saying. Here we go. When this historical background is understood, it becomes clearer how the young SDA church arrived at Sunday worship becoming the mark of the beast. Though the proof text method of biblical interpretation through this, the early Adventists were basically interpreting scripture in light of what was happening around them. Instead of interpreting scripture in light of scripture's own background, they were placing emphasis on what scripture meant to them before emphasizing what Scripture meant to its primary audience. And you can, if you want to read this book, uh, The Person of Jesus, the God's Obligatory Sabbath. Uh, they did the same thing with Revelation 6, Matthew 24, interpreting them to mean Lisbon, the Lisbon earthquake in 1755, and then 1833, meteor shower and the so-called day of, of dark. These are all historical things in the Adventist church that have been placed in Scripture, all these events had happened in times recent uh, to the, the, the young SDA church. And so they interpreted the Bible in light of what was happening around them. Wrong hermeneutical approach. That's an awful approach. As demonstrated by some of our own scholars, their interpretation of these passages are exegetically flawed, as these passages have nothing to do with what our pioneers have interpreted them to be. Sadly, we, the religious children of the pioneers, who live more than a century and a half later with unprecedented scientific information in biblical studies, continue to espouse such embarrassing theories regarding Revelation 6, Matthew 24, and Sunday being the mark of the beast as per Revelation 13. Again, the biblical scholars of our church are doing our members a disservice on these issues. End of quote. So I want you to understand that the mark of the beast was never about Christians ceasing from labor on Sunday and worshiping God. And if, and if it has any future implications at all, which it very well could, okay, it will not be about either. It's not going to be about Sabbath. It just isn't. That's not what it's about. It's about who you're honoring. Worshiping God on Sunday was never forbidden in the Old Testament. You won't find one verse that forbids worshiping God on Sunday, nor is it ever prohibited in the New Testament. It just isn't. Find one verse. I challenge you, find one verse that makes this claim and that prescribes the level of damnation that Ellen White and the Adventist Church place on worshiping God on Sunday. Find one verse. You can't. It's not there. This concept is never presented in Scripture or church history or as something satanic, the mark of the beast, or apostasy towards God that will damn Christians. This, this Unfortunately, this epitomizes reading a modern Ellen White context into the Bible and then twisting texts to mean something that it doesn't mean. So friends, 
I really want to encourage you as you continue on in your spiritual journey, learn how to keep scripture in context. And what do I mean by context? It's the, te- it's the context that created the verse and the chapter and the letter, the epistle, the book, what you're reading. Keep it in context. Fight hard to keep the, the honor of Scripture, to hold Scripture in high regard as you study the Word of God. I look forward to the next time that we dialogue together. Until then, don't forget, go to the website, go to the blog articles, hit the notification button, or subscribe to the YouTube channel to be notified for our next conversation. God bless. Thank you.